judicious use is one of five core principles that make up stewardship. So antimicrobial stewardship is a formalized approach to managing antimicrobials in medical settings. Um, it's gained a lot of traction because it does ultimately improve antimicrobial outcomes and reduces resistance. Um, it isn't focused on just reducing antimicrobial use. It's really more than that. It's about preventive steps that occur before. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast and joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Locke Carricker. Dr. Carricker is the moral professor at Iowa State University and the director of the Swine Medicine Education Center. Dr. Carricker, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And if you would, please start with a brief introduction for the audience. Well, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. It's great to talk to you again, uh, Clayton. And um, I've been practicing swine medicine now for about 25 years. I've been at Iowa State for close to 20 years. I've practiced in a, a commercial production system before that, where I really had my second round of education. And I'm primarily focused on uh, teaching. I do a little applied research in the pharmacology range and then work with producers and clients on um, referral cases related to swine. You mentioned the pharmacology lock, and that's a good launching point for our discussion here today. You've done a lot of work throughout your career on uh, judicious use of antibiotics, and then now more recently antibiotic or antimicrobial stewardship. Let's start there. Um, for somebody who's listening and doesn't understand the difference between those terms, what's the difference between judicious use and stewardship? Well, it's a great question, and the short answer is, is that judicious use is one of five core principles that make up stewardship. So antimicrobial stewardship is a formalized approach to managing antimicrobials in medical settings. Um, it's gained a lot of traction because it does ultimately improve antimicrobial outcomes and reduces resistance. Um, it isn't focused on just reducing antimicrobial use. It's really more than that. It's about preventive steps that occur before. And so just to give you kind of a, uh, an example, the five core principles totally are you commit to stewardship. So there's an owner, there's someone in the organization that drives it, eats, sleeps, and breathes it. Um, the second core is to advocate for a system of care to prevent common diseases. So when you think about how we do things in the pig world, we're pretty good at preventive um, approaches. Um, number three is to select and use antimicrobials ju uh, drugs judiciously. So there's our judicious use that we have been practicing. Number four is evaluate antimicrobial drug use practices. So constantly gather data and really follow up and see how, this, how the processes are working and how the drugs use are working. And then number five is to have a plan to educate and build expertise. So, so judicious use is an important piece, but it's just one of a bigger, um, a bigger set of principles that are part of stewardship. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. It's a, a formal program, it sounds like, and certainly not anything that's directed only to swine, but we're a big user of antimicrobials. So is this something that potentially the swine industry will have to embrace, or is this something that the swine industry is going to have to embrace? Is it an if or a when? Well, I think it's very clearly a win, and, and here's why I say that. Um, on the human medicine side, there's quite a bit of subsidy from the federal government for most of our human medical activities, even if you don't recognize it directly in, in your particular interactions. And so one component of those um, federal funds now has become having a formal stewardship plan, literally a plan that you can show someone that they could potentially look at and then compare against 
your practices that they observe to see if you're actually following your own plan. So it's a formal plan and the, and the, the carrot, if you will, on the human side has been those federal funds related to health care. We don't have that carrot on the veterinary side. The owner pays the cost. And so um, the concern is that as they see um, success with these programs on the human side, at some point we will be handed a program to implement along with regulations to drive it. Now, I wish I had a crystal ball that told me what day that's going to happen, um, but, I, but I don't. So, you know, that might be in the next couple of years. It might be longer. But, but my point is that it's definitely coming in one form or fashion, and we would be better off if we created our own plan and our own programs that fit what we do before we get assigned something that may not fit what we do. And, and I think there, there are elements of that component that we just simply do already, and, and we're not getting the credit we deserve for those things. You mentioned it's a formal program, Locke. Is it an internationally recognized program? Is this something that the Europeans are on board with, Asia's on board with, or is this kind of a U.S.-specific program at this point? So we see uh, various versions uh, really globally. So there are a lot of uh, – most countries have some – some process, some formulation by which they try to achieve better antimicrobial stewardship and by which they support that with federal government rules and regs and things like that. So um, they, they aren't necessarily structured exactly the same. And, and the beauty of this, uh, this sort of recognition that formal stewardship is these five core principles gives you an enormous amount of latitude below that level, that initial level to sort of specify what are the actions that fit each of those principles, right? So, so in the human medicine side, the dentistry stewardship plan might look very different than the perisurgical stewardship plan, right? It's in a hospital. In a hospital might have two plans, depending on what part of the hospital we're talking about or what, what division. And so it gives us a lot of latitude, but with the expectation that we are addressing those five key principles in some form or fashion. We uh, uh, we have a formal plan. It's going to come down the the pike. Could you give us a kind of a brief? Uh, it could be a made up example, lock, but like for a producer, a production system. What are some of the things they might have to shift a little bit, do a little bit differently, more paperwork, or even maybe a, a staffing role needed to to be able to demonstrate we got a plan and we're following the plan. Well, I think the first is just um, it's going to be relatively simple. It's going to be accumulating the things that we already do, right? So um, I mentioned that I think Swan Medicine does a large number of the core principles very well. In fact, maybe better than it's even possible to accomplish in human medicine. And so here's an opportunity for us to proactively demonstrate that and claim that ground in respect to the, the steps that we do take for um, better antimicrobial stewardship and, and conservation of that resource, right? So to give you a specific example about that, when you think about the um, core principle number two, that's advocate for a system of care to prevent common diseases, um, we, we tend to, to primarily rely on vaccination. We prefer to vaccinate over treating sick animals, right? There's all sorts of um, beneficial reasons to prioritize that. Um, we don't have vaccine refusal issues in the pig world. If the owner decides the pigs are going to get vaccinated, they're going to get vaccinated, right? And in the human arena, they have to deal with those issues, and that um, impacts uptake of the vaccine and things like that. So there, there are some of these situations where we're already doing it. We're doing it fairly well. And so a formal plan might just be um, compiling those things that you're already doing um, putting an index to it, deciding what of it is, could be forward facing or outward facing and what needs to be internal. So that's another feature as you build these plans. Um, you might have an internal plan that has detail that can't be facing public publicly like um, uh, client details or things of that nature, right, or cost issues. But um, there are some things you could put in a forward facing manner. And so we have the latitude to decide what those are. And, and build our plans very specifically for what we do. We are currently um, finishing up a training program at Iowa State where we'll be able to make it available online and walk producers through, walk veterinarians through and help them understand what things could go into a formal plan. And then it's really about having that plan accessible and being able to point to it and show 
also that you're doing the things that are in your plan. Is biosecurity within the scope of principle two, the disease prevention part? Absolutely. I mean, that's a huge part, right? And that, that's one where we spend an enormous amount of time and effort and education. Um, we, we actually make our days longer and more complicated on the farm in order to follow biosecurity steps. And so I think that's another example of something we do really well. It's widely recognized as a critical part of antimicrobial stewardship. And so I think we need to claim, you know, credit that's due for making those efforts. And and I think stewardship plans are valuable to us for that reason, because it's an opportunity to showcase those things that we're doing really well. And, and you can build these plans. There isn't a specific form, you know, that you're going to download and fill out. But um, it's more about creating a plan that's specific to your organization. And so you can build a plan at a farm level. You can build a plan at a practice level or at a production system level or maybe a pig flow level. Um, anywhere where there's standardized or consistent SOP management practices, things like that, that you could include in the plan as these are steps we're taking that we know um, positively influences our antimicrobial stewardship. The program's coming at some point. Um, we, we do most of the program today. It's something that uh, our consumers, I'm sure, would embrace. Um, typically in the pig industry, we wait until we are pulled into doing something like this. But if we wanted to push this and, like you're saying, claim that moral high ground, uh, what do you expect is the, uh, the organization or, I guess, the pathway to collectively submit this information and say, hey, look what we're doing, right? Is this something that would be packer-led, retail-led, National Pork Board, right? Where do you see that, that leadership and, and the collective pu push coming from? Well, we know that some of the packers have requested this type of information, I think, because largely they see the writing on the wall and what's coming. And I think because our consumers demand it. Right. And so so this is part about being responsive to consumer expectations as well. That's important. Um, there isn't, for example, a spot where you have to submit your um, plan and have it approved, for example. And so um, it's really about having that plan when people ask for it. And, and, and if at some point in the future, we're required to have it to market animals, that sort of thing. You've got it in hand. And so um, there's really no reason to be concerned about how information will be shared or how it will be used because you control the information. But it's just like a biosecurity plan. It's not really um, at the forefront of people's thought process. It's hard to deploy if it isn't written down and and uh, if it isn't gathered in some place, if there isn't a reference or how to do things. So so it's like anything else you want to make sure is getting done routinely and consistently and effectively in a business. You write a plan for it. And that's really what this is. And um, if, you know, folks are interested in getting a start on that, seeing what it looks like, we've pulled together some outlines of what we think could go in a plan based on sort of typical things that happen around pig production that would be meaningful and, and that would be useful in terms of um, pushing forward this argument that we are doing antimicrobial stewardship. And we'd be happy to share those with folks if they're interested. Locke, it sounds a lot to me like um, what PQA did for the industry. Um, and uh, I've had many folks tell me, you know, PQA was started with two goals, get antibiotic residues out of pigs and get needles out of pigs, right? PQA was just like this, where it was producer generated, right? We decided how are we going to do that? We measured it, which you can do with antibiotic resistance. And it sounds like that's part of this plan. And we could literally tell everybody from retailers to consumers, try Trust us. We got this. We hear we hear you. We know our farms. We know how we can pull this off. Don't necessarily ask us for all. You, we don't need to tell you the ingredients in the cake that we're baking. Right. We're, you're going to get to see the cake and you're going to get to see the results. And then those results create the trust. They create the trust in the process. And we don't have to worry about somebody else creating the process for us if we go down that pathway. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And at the end of the day, all those steps and efforts, they help us sort of review what we do and, and get a little better at that. They foster discussion about ways we can improve on it. And ultimately, there's value in that we reduce antimicrobial resistance. And that's important for us when we need to treat pigs. It's important for us when we want to guarantee people or have, have a safe product, you know, and it's important for us for the environments that we live in and the people that we care about. So um, I think there's a lot of net benefit above and beyond just 
um, meeting someone's expectation that we have a plan. And so that's why I think they're going to be valuable in the future. Tremendous stuff, Locke. Can't thank you enough for coming on. I know uh, amongst your many responsibilities, you got to ed- educate some young students and you got to go. So we'll, we'll give you the time back here. But thanks so much for coming on the podcast and sharing that knowledge. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we couldn't do it without the audience. So to the audience listening, thank you very much for being a part of this with Locke and I. Um, we appreciate you listening in to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please check out our website, swinehealthblackbelt.com, uh, and subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already uh, for more great episodes like this one. For Dr. Locke Character, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.